Um, as we uh, as we did this previous year, we have a, a really amazing lineup of virtual speakers coming to us from across the United States, which is really exciting for us as well. Uh, today, as usual, we have some quick announcements. Um, we have an amazing speaker and we'll have some time for Q&A and of course at the end of the, the meeting some virtual door prizes so hang around for the end you never know what we have to give away <laughs> so just a reminder we're in a brand new year and so HBA dues are due they do cover the whole year January through December and as I mentioned every time um, it's a great way for all of you to get to know your local beekeepers, your neighbors who have bees just around the corner. And of course, come to these amazing um, speaking events where we, we, uh, we get authors from all over the country now. So it's very exciting. Um, as I've mentioned before, being a member also gives you a lot of perks. We have a lot of equipment that we do loan out. Um, during harvest season and other opportunities. So don't forget to be a member so you can take advantage of those as well as to get on our mailing list for the SCEP and you can be on our swarm list for swarms as they become available. How many of you have already seen some swarming? I actually saw some come across the other day. Whoa. Yep. <laughs> I got a text from someone that said, hey, you wanna come get this? I was like, no, thank you though. <laughs> All I've right. One swarm and three removals so far. Oh, wow. I, actually, I think I sent you one, Mark. <laughs> I was like, call Mark. <laughs> oh, gosh. It's starting off quick here in Houston. Now, Tom, obviously, our weather is much more milder. So, you know, we, we, we almost be keep all the, the year round. So, it's amazing. It is. So today we have some great and very special announcements. As you know, we're in a new year and we have a little bit of, um, I would say turnover on our HBA board for some of our uh, members who have turned out and they're gonna take a nice break from us for a little, little bit, but they won't go far. But I'm very excited to introduce you to two of our new board members. Laura Mullen joins us as the 2021 treasurer and Kyle Wolf joins us as the 2021 secretary. Laura, would you like to say hi and say a few words? Sure. Hi, my name is Laura Mullen. I've been keeping bees for about 14, 15 months now. I have two hives in Montrose. Uh, it all started when I was trying to be the most organic gardener that I could be. <laughs> and uh, my other job when I'm not beekeeping is I'm a, a licensed CPA in the state of Texas and I do personal income and property taxes in uh, Houston. Yes, perfect for this job. <laughs> to get to manage our, our, our money. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Kyle, how about you? Hey there, um, I'm Kyle Wolf, and uh, I originally got into beekeeping back in 2015. Um, I had actually attended the Cattle Trace Beekeepers Association's Bee School there, and first started uh, trying to trap out a beehive from a local cemetery in Northeast Texas. And it didn't quite work out all that great and didn't end up actually picking up beekeeping again until 2018, whenever I moved to Houston and uh, started uh, working as the volunteer coordinator at Herman Park Conservancy. And uh, Shelly Rice, of course, is the, the volunteer beekeeper over there. And uh, that just kind of reignited the fire in it. And now this past December, I am now in the uh, master beekeeper apprentice program so excited hey. about that too so um, and now excited to be a part of you guys so. thank you thank you well you know we're just so glad that you guys are taking the opportunity to be part of the board and we have a lot of fun things planned for this year um, so we'll have everybody back on as we get through our scheduling and then I would be remiss if I didn't spend a moment to say thank you to Nicole and Shelly Oh my goodness. So you guys, I cannot tell you the heavy lifting that's gone on behind the scenes uh, to get Houston Beekeepers Association really up and running the last three years. And especially since, you know, in 2020, we've had to really just pivot and figure out how do we do this virtually? So uh, Nicole and Shelly, I just can't thank you enough. Um, and it, it wouldn't have happened without you. So thank you for, for bringing us along these last few years. 
Um, and I hope you don't go far because, you know, we love to have you <laughs> help out. Um, we do have a very, um, a very lovely award headed your way for your uh, service and in recognition of you. Um, and so I'll have those over to you probably next week. Um, but is there anything either one of you would like to say to the members as, as you transition off the board? I'm kind of shy on Zoom calls, so <laughs> I will say that um, I'm really excited how the club has, how what it's become in the last three years, because when we picked the ball up, it was a real mess. And so I just didn't, I didn't know what was going to happen, but thank goodness Nicole was sitting two seats over and <laughs> let me volunteer her. And I think it all really uh, came together. So yeah, thank you so much for your patience with me as treasurer, because I was never meant to be a treasurer, more <laughs> like a treasurer. <laughs> you did great. <laughs> um, I just want to say that I feel a, a big part of beekeeping is giving back to the new beekeepers and beekeeper education. And, you know, I encourage everyone to take a year or two and volunteer in some capacity, either with the club or, you know, students or something. So, um, you yeah, know, make that part of your beekeeping practice. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. It's very rewarding. All right. Well, thank you both again. And um, I know we'll see you um, on our meetings and I'm sure you'll both be involved as well. So uh, looking forward to it. All right. So today we have um, Dr. Tom Seeley with us. Now, many of you have probably read his books. I know I have. My one of my favorite books is *The Bee Democracy*. I just, I just love that one. And then, um, of course, I haven't a chance, you know, to read the newest one yet about the secret lives of bees. But um, I can't wait for that one too. Um, but for those of you who are on the, the the call today and joining us, Tom is literally like the author and educator of choice, um, and has many years of experience. Um, in the field and authoring books. And so with that, Tom, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much, um, Sandra. And um, thank you, Shelley, too, for welcoming me when I was originally first signed on. It's really my pleasure. And it's, it's actually very fascinating for me to hear you guys talking about, oh, swarming season is starting. Um, we won't get swarms up here for another three, maybe four months late late April or mid July or mid August or no mid May um, so it's uh, it's fascinating to just hear you hear the conversation already um, I'll tr I hope what I can share with you will be fascinating as, as well um, so let's see I should what do I remind me what I need to do oh share my screen there we go that'll do it there we go great um, and here's the the title of what we're going to be looking at this evening, Darwinian beekeeping, which is an evolutionary approach to beekeeping or apiculture. And uh, I like to start with the image of these two gentlemen. You probably, most of you probably recognize Lorenzo Langstroth on, on the left, and maybe many of you recognize Charles Darwin there on the right. And the reason I put them up together is because they both relate very much to this talk. In fact, they set the ground ground uh, foundation for this, for what I'll be talking about today. Um, and interestingly, they were almost exact contemporaries, born almost the same year in 1810, 1809. Um, they both um, lived, had, had long lifespans, and they both were had an interest in honeybees. Langstroth, of course, is the inventor of the movable frame hive. And uh, Darwin, it was a fascination with the comb building, which he thought was one of the most challenging things for his theory of evolution by natural selection to explain. Like, how could bees ever evolve this ability to build these perfectly regular hexagonal cell patterns in their combs? And then he he realized that it, it, it's not that they actually build the hexagons, they built cylinders and push them together and then they form the hexagons. Like, 
soap bubbles to form hexagons. Um, so they were both interested in comb building, um, and they both also had insights that can help us with our beekeeping. For Langstroth, it's of course the movable, movable frame hive, a, a marvelous invention um, for enabling us to go into our hives, into our colonies, and examine them, take them apart, look at them without really doing much damage at all. And for Darwin, it was this concept of evolution by natural selection, which I think has really provides some very good ideas about thinking about beekeeping as a practice. And that's what this talk is about. Looking at beekeeping through the lens of looking at the at the honeybee as a very well adapted insect, a bee that knows a lot about beekeeping, so to speak. I think we would all agree. But let's quickly do a review of what is what exactly we mean by evolution by natural selection. Evolution is change over time. And I'll, I'll illustrate how change over time works by natural selection using the example of the evolution of insects to acquire resistance to pesticides. And so let's imagine a and we do this by uh, walking through this little diagram over here on the on the uh, left. You've got a population of, of insects initially, and they have different levels of resistance to some pesticide. If it's an individual's mark coated by yellow, it's low resistance, red, it's high resistance. So you can see there's a force before the pesticide is applied, individuals vary in their resistance. After the pesticide is applied, only the individuals with high resistance to that pesticide are still around. And those are the only ones that re are um, going to reproduce. So after time, your whole population looks like this. And this has happened many, many times in many species with many pesticides. So it's a, it's a really familiar example of evol evolution by natural selection where the selective agent is the pesticide. So that's the idea. And why is that relevant to beekeeping? It's, it applies to beekeeping in the following way. It, it shows us, it tells us that everything that a honeybee colony does as it lives on its own is done to favor its survival and reproduction. Everything that, the, everything that the bees do, like of course the way they build their combs very efficiently with a very efficient use of beeswax with a hexagonal pattern, the way the queen lays, lays an egg in the cell with just one end um, attached to the floor of the cell. The way the nurse bees provide the, the young larvae with enough food, a surplus of food, so that they actually float in their food. And then, of course, there's the, all the marvelous structures of a worker bee with her beautiful pollen basket, her nectar, or honey stomach, and sophisticated legs and mouth parts and wings, and all of that stuff is there because it helps, it's helped these insects survive and, and reproduce. And then, of course, also the combs and their honey storage. So everything that it really is the case that everything the colonies do when they're living on their own and thus they control their lives is done to favor their survival and reproduction. And one way to think of this is bird, the bees are superb beekeepers. Um, some people say, yeah, they're the, the best beekeepers. And Darwinian beekeeping is an approach to beekeeping whereby one allows the bees to use their own beekeeping skills fully. Let the bees, in a sense, let the bees be bees. Um, sometimes this Darwinian beekeeping, well, it goes by different names. Sometimes it's called natural beekeeping. Another name is apocentric beekeeping. You might be wondering though, hey, wait, can we really let the bees be the beekeepers? Haven't all the wild, haven't all the wild colonies been killed off by Varroa? Those are the colonies where there is no beekeeper. They're living off on their own. And I wondered that um, uh, some ten, uh, back in the early 2000s um, because um, there, were, there are many colonies 
um, living in the woods around Ithaca, New York, and I'll show you some images of Ithaca so you can see how wooded it is around here. Much of the, it's very hilly, and those, most of those hills are covered with forests. So we're going to be looking briefly now at, to address this question. Can we let the bees be beekeepers? Um, and the best evidence that we can is the fact that if you go out into the woods, the bees are still alive, even though they're infested with varroa. And so I'm, a lot of this talk I'm going to make talk about a contrast between managed colonies, those living in our hives, and wild colonies, those living in trees and buildings. Let me explain the evidence that, that, that varroa and the viruses that go with varroa haven't killed off all the wild colonies. They're not all gone. They're, of course, they're not treated, and yet, as we'll see, um, they're surviving. And they're surviving, these wild colonies are surviving, indeed thriving, in remote parts of the uh, remote places. And I say that, it's what I'm going to show you is specifically based on what I've studied in New York State, but I've also done the, the same kind of work in Pennsylvania, um, Vermont, and Maine. And um, so I think it's not just where I'm working is not peculiar, not unusual. Where I've done the, looked at this question of how the wild colonies are surviving, even without any care from humans, has been, the location is the Arnott Forest. This is a, as the sign says, it's a teaching and research forest of Cornell University. Its area is only about 6.6 .6 square miles, but it's surrounded by state lands, which enlarge the total forest land up to hundreds of square miles, of which it's just one little piece. Here's what it looks like. It's a deciduous fo forest, and, the, and it's um, it's on an area, part of the country where it's hilly. We're in the we're in the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. We're what called the Appalachian Highlands. And the reason I focus on the Arnott Forest in this story here is that this forest is the one place in all of North America for which we have data on wild colony abundance before the arrival of Varroa, and then again after. And the reason we have data on the abundance of colonies in this forest before Varroa arrived in, is because back in 1978, I went out and surveyed this forest for wild colonies of honeybees. I was just, and I, there I was just following my curiosity. I, I just wondered, well, how many bees live out in these woods? <laughs> I have no idea. And um, I'll show you how I do that now. Um, I locate wild colonies. Um, by bee hunting. Sometimes it's called bee lining. And the process is pretty simple, but it takes a lot of skill too. You go to a patch of flowers, like these goldenrod flowers in August. You capture bees in a little box and you put a comb in there, a piece of square of comb with sugar syrup in it. And then you, once the bees have found the comb, you let them out. And they like the sugar syrup because it's, it's better than any food they can find elsewhere. And um, they'll go, they'll go home, those the first the bees you introduce to the comb, they'll go home, they'll bring other bees, and soon eventually you have a traffic of bees between your little feeding station and their home. And once, you, once you've got, got that set up, then you basically work your way back down the bee line, the, the traffic line of the bees. See what direction they fly home to determine their bee line, and then you work down the bee line. Here's an example of how of a bee hunt that I did on the Cornell campus one spring. I caught bees in the in a flower garden here, and I didn't I, I'd seen bees on the flowers, so I knew there was there were bees somewhere around, but I'm pretty sure I was pretty sure they weren't there was no there were no hives nearby. So I then with those bees I was able to track them down. I started here, jumped the feeder to here, then I jumped the feeder to here, to here, to here. Once I got to here, the bees were only needing about two minutes to leave my feeder with a load of food go to their home, wherever it was, and come back. And so I just, then I, at that point, I do as a bee hunter does, you just search down the, the line, looking at every tree, looking up, looking down, looking for bees flying in and out. And that's what I could see up here. I saw bees flying in and out of this oak tree up, up here, high up. They're usually high off the ground. You might wonder, how on earth do you see little bees <laughs> flying in and out of a knot hole high in a tree? Well. It's not that hard, really, because what you, what you see 
is the flight of the bees, the flight motion of the bees, and often the sunlight sparkles off their wings. So it's quite eye-catching. I don't know if this video is coming through very well, but it, I hope it, it comes through well enough to see that there's a lot of traffic around the entrance of a bee tree, and it makes it visible. Oops, don't want to do that. I want to go to the next slide. So here's the map of the Arnott Forest. And so I knew there were 2.5 colonies per square mile in 1978. And I went back to the Arnott Forest in 2002 to see how many colonies were alive then. And I, to be honest, I expected to find no honeybee colonies because in the mid 90s, uh, Varroa reached us up here. And for several winters in a row, before I started using varroacides, miticides, um, I was losing 80% of my colonies each winter. And I, I knew that up in the woods, like in the Arnott Forest, n those bees were not getting any treatments with miticides. So I figured they were all, they were had all been killed off. So I went to the forest in 2002, went actually to the back entrance of the forest up here, set up a bee, caught bees off the flowers, and I was, first of all, amazed to find bees on the flowers, and then I just started lining the bees, and I found what worked my way to one bee tree down here to the south, and then I worked my way to another bee tree up north, because I saw bees flying off in two directions. And then I worked my way around this western half of the forest, and lo and behold, I found, what I found was that, oh, and this is an example of a bee tree, that's me that's the nest entrance of the bees, and this is a big, tall sugar maple tree. So this is a, it's an old, it's not an old growth forest, but it's got, it's a very mature forest. And the bees like to nest up high. You might wonder, why do they like to nest up high? I think part of the reason is it, safety from black bears. <laughs> there are a lot of black bears in this forest. And uh, so that's, and the, the bears don't find these nests high up. But if, a, if one of these trees blows down, then the bears do find it, and then the bees are more, have more trouble. And another thing is in the winter, when it's cold and snowy, um, a nest entrance that's high off the ground is much less like to, is much more accessible and open all winter long than one that's close to the ground where it gets covered with snow. So that's what, so they found bee trees in the Arnott Forest in 2002. And if you're interested in knowing how this is done, I wrote a little book on it called Following the Wild Bees. But the key thing here is that I found in 2002 the same density or abundance of colonies per square mile as I did in 1978. It was exactly the same. 2.5 colonies here, 2.5 colonies here. Now that's not many colonies. That's a low density of colonies. And but I, I but I think that's what this forest can support. It's mostly woods, not very many open areas. There are basswood trees and tulip poplar trees and so there are nectar sources in this forest, but it's not like open countryside. So I think that's what limits it to these 2.5 colonies per square mile. But the key thing here is that the colonies were still there, even though Varroa had been there since 1994, or since Varroa had been in the area since 1994. See, I did, I was delighted to find the bees still there, but I, I couldn't be sure that they had Varroa. This, these bees are living up in the hills, and I thought, well, maybe, yeah, even though the Varroa is in the beekeeper's colonies, like my colonies, maybe maybe somehow the Varroa doesn't get up into the hills, into these wild colonies. So what I did next was, I, the following two summers, I put bait hides in the forest. These are just, I just put an old 10-frame Langstroth hive up on a little platform in a tree, and I reduced the entrance, and I put in old combs, so that makes it really attractive to swarms and I catch swarms in the forest. And so in 2003 and 2004, I caught 11 swarms in the Arnott Forest. And I looked into those hives where the bees moved in and everyone had Varroa, every colony had Varroa. They didn't bring in other diseases, not American fowl brood or Euro European fowl brood. One of them did come down with chalk brood. But the key thing is here, uh, there wasn't much disease, but there was a lot of Varroa. Every colony had Varroa. So at this point, I could conclude that the Arnott Forest colonies are infested with Varroa, and yet, and yet they're surviving. So that made, in fact, that made it even more curious or mysterious. 
And that's what we'll be looking at in the rest of this talk. But to come back to this question, can we let the bees be the beekeepers? Can bees can bees survive these days without our 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 aid and, and attention? The answer is yes. We can let the bees be the beekeepers. And that's what and this is what led me to think about oh, okay, what's going on with these wild colonies? How is it that they can survive without human intervention? And this is so that's what I'm going to share with you. And this Darwinian beekeeping is modeled on what the bees are how the bees are living in the wild. And I want to stress a couple of things before we go into it in, into the details of Darwinian beekeeping. First of all, I want to make it crystal clear that Darwinian beekeeping is not for large-scale beekeepers. It's really for a small-scale beekeeping operation, and it may not even work for urban beekeepers, um, where you, where if you're living in a little yard area, you can, you know, you've got a lot of colonies crowded together. That would be hard to do. That situation would be a poor one for Darwinian beekeeping. But it, Darwinian beekeeping is an option then for small-scale beekeepers who want to avoid chemical treatments and who are satisfied with modest honey crops, maybe 20, 25 pounds per hive. You'll see why, I'm, why I say that shortly. Another way to think of it is uh, to do, look at a contrast between Darwinian beekeeping and commercial beekeeping. It's like, to my mind, it's like the difference between having one backyard apple tree versus having a commercial orchard. Or it's like the difference between bird watching or poultry farming. Well, bird watching is probably a pretty good parallel to our Darwinian beekeeping because when you do bird watching, what do you do? You put up a bird house and you put out some food at a feeder. So that's about it. And then you just enjoy enjoy watching the birds. And there's a lot of, you know, so Darwinian beekeeping can be a, thought of as kind of like a, uh, more like almost bee watching than beekeeping because you're mostly watching the bees and not doing much, in or not keeping them very, very intensively. And it's also the difference between just pleasure versus profit. Though you can certainly have pleasure as a commercial beekeeper too. But in Darwinian beekeeping, there's little or no profit, mostly pleasure. And I want to stress, both approaches are okay. They just have different names. They're for different, for different people with different names. Well, here's the key idea for understanding the logic of Darwinian beekeeping. It's, it, we're going to, what we want to think about is a, looking at the the original environment of honeybees, the environment in which honeybee colonies evolved to live, the, the environment in which and in which wild colonies still live. So that's, we'll, call, we'll frequently be talking about the original environment of honeybees, and the other situation we'll be looking at is the current circumstances of honeybees. And this is the environment in which managed colonies live. Most most colonies that we know about are kept in beehives. They're managed colonies, and so that's the so that's why I call it the current circumstance. So, original environment versus current circumstances. Now let's compare what those some of the details of the difference between original environment and current circumstance. Well, we'll do that next. I should. What I wanted to say now is that in Darwinian beekeeping, as you can see, the goal is to enable managed colonies, ones kept by beekeepers like you and me, enable our managed colonies insofar as possible to live in the honeybees' original environment, and let the and thus to let the honeybees use all of their own beekeeping skills and without our interference. Okay, let's let's look at some differences or comparisons between original environment and current circumstances. Well, one difference is on the original environment, honeybee colonies are genetically adapted to their location. The current circumstances with managed colonies is often, not always, but often the colonies are not genetically adapted to their location. Let me give you an example. Every spring in the bee catalogs, the bee magazines, you see the ads from the queen producers. And, and here's one that catches my eye every spring the ultimate queen bee from Hawaii, 
well, it might be the ultimate queen bee for Hawaii, but I don't think it's the ultimate queen bee for Vermont or New York or Michigan or Montana or Washington State. It's it's probably a great bee for the you know really a warm place with a warm climate. So yeah, so bees that um, are in doing this Darwinian beekeeping, we want bees that are genetically adapted to their to their location, not genetically adapted to another location. Another difference between original environment and current circumstances is that in the original environment, colonies live widely spaced in the woods. I didn't stress that on the map where I showed you the Arnott Forest, but they're, they're about 3,000 feet apart on average, the bee trees. And this is one of my apiaries before I became a Darwinian beekeeper. And you can see the colonies are, I had them crowded together because I, I had to put a, a fence around these to keep the black bears out. So the colony colonies were pressed right up next to each other. Another difference is that in nature, in the original environment, colonies live in relatively small nest cavities, about this volume of one deep hive body. And I show that in this diagram below, where I, I dissected, I collected and dissected 21 wild colonies' nests, nests in hollow trees. And this is the volume distribution. And there's the units at the bottom are in liters. But what's easier to understand is if we use the units of deep 10 frame hive bodies. In nature, you can see the distribution is somewhere around one deep hive body. Very few nest cavities in the wild are as big as two deeps, and none is three deeps. There was one oddball one where the bees were nesting in this gigantic cavity in a big old beech tree. And they were, but they weren't using the whole cavity. They were using a little bit of the cavity at the very top of the of the, of the nest. So anyhow, it usually in nature they're living in a hot nest cavity about the size of sometimes a little smaller, sometimes a little bigger than one deep ten frame hive body. In contrast, under current circumstances, we super up our bees. We give them often two double deeps as a brood chamber, and then we put honey supers on top. Oops. And as it says in this bee catalog, the, this is the best and most complete wooden kit. Well, it, it, it is the best and most complete wooden kit for somebody, that, for a beekeeper that wants to make lots of honey. It's probably not the best and most complete wooden kit for the bees, however, because this a colony this big can really get the bees into trouble with varroa unless they're medicated against the varroa. They hold so much brood in a big colony like that. It's, it's a gold mine for Varroa. Okay, so one, this is a third difference, the size of the nest cavity. A fourth difference is in nature. The nest cavity walls are quite thick. They're usually four to six inches of wood thick, and they have a rough surface on the inside of the rotted out tree cavity, uh, and the bees cover with propolis. This is a, uh, an image on the side of one of these wild nests cavities. I, I chipped off the propolis coating over the rotted wood. And you can see that if the bees hadn't covered that wood with propolis, which keeps it very clean, it's antimicrobial, that this surface, this material would be like an ideal medium for um, bacteria and molds to grow on. It's, but So the bees clean that up, cover with propolis. And in contrast, our hives tend to be um, Langstroth hives. It's a quite a thin-walled wooden structure, and usually the wood is so smooth the bees don't apply propolis. This hive, the bees were induced to pry, apply propolis by having propolis collection screen material was stapled to the inner walls of the hive. But you could see that where there wasn't those, that propolis screen, collection screen, the, the bees don't put much propolis down. A fifth difference between original environment and current circumstances under beekeeping practice. In nature, colonies build drone comb freely. They, in fact, they invest about 20, 15 to 20 percent of the total comb area is devoted to drone comb. You can see that. Here's a, a photo of a big of a interior of a natural nest. And all this is drone comb. And, 
and there's some worker comb over here and there's lots of worker cells behind here but they make big patches of drone comb whereas in our managed colonies we generally discourage them from building drone comb we give them uh, found comb foundation with worker cells and the colonies produce fewer drones now that's that's good for honey production because in fact yes there's strong evidence that if colonies rear lots of drones they make less honey because they've been investing a lot of their resources in making drones which don't make honey they eat honey um, on the other hand the wild colonies they don't, don't need to produce lots and lots of honey but they do benefit from producing lots of drones because that's how they pass on their genes one of the two ways the other way is by making swarms sixth comparison in nature as we've seen the nest entrance is high off the ground in where i live in the forests i study the bees the average height is eight meters or about 25 feet up and of course in a bee in a bee yard an apiary the entrance is quite low to the ground it's right near the ground there's another difference between original environment and current circumstances. In nature, the colonies have diverse pollen sources, and often they do even, even in a beekeeping situation, but there are some situations where colonies are moved into pollination areas where there's very low diversity of pollen sources, and the extreme is, of course, the um, almond orchards in California and Oregon. Another comparison is that in the wild, the colonies are not treated for disease, and this sets the stage for the bees to evolve resistant to Varroa, and we'll be looking at that. <coughs> Current circumstances, most beekeepers do treat their colonies for disease, and so that helps the bees stay alive by keeping the virus levels low in the bees, but it also means that the bees are, even, even bees with no resistance to uh, the mites and, and the viruses are survive, and so the bees do not evolve resistance to Varroa. Okay. So, back to the principle of Darwinian beekeeping. In, it is, insofar as possible, put managed colonies back into the bees' original environment, their environment to which they're evolutionarily adapted. And, or another way to say all that is to say, allow managed colonies to live more naturally. And the colonies managed by D the Darwinian beekeeping principles will make less honey, but as we'll see, they will have better health. So what I want to do now is to go through the guidelines, my guidelines for Darwinian beekeeping. And the first one, which is very fundamental, that's why I put it first, is keep bees that are adapted to your location. And there's several ways you can do this. You could rear queens from your best survivor colonies or you could capture swarms with bait hives um, set up in remote places so you're going to be catching swarms from wild colonies not um, that have been able to survive in your location and or purchase queens from a queen breeder who produces locally adapted queens and ideally doesn't treat for mites and there are and i keep i i have Keep an eye out for those, and there are, I know of beekeepers, uh, queen breeders, who do produce exactly this, locally adapted queens, and who are not treating them for mites, so their colonies have very good resistance. And I'll, I'll mention some shortly. Let me give you an example of, of what, how, how much benefit you can actually gain by collecting queens if you're, if you're in a place where there are wild colonies, there's a population of wild colonies, how m much better the bees are that you get if you get your queens by capturing wild swarms rather than buying them through the internet from a commercial queen producer. And this is a small study I did um, uh, during the last summer, not or the summer before last, and I, and I compared queens that I bought from Oliveras, a, a queen producer in California, Big, very large queen producer and so some of the queens came from Oliveira's queens and the others came from bait hives that I put up um, around Ithaca and so I set up I caught swarms and I purchased queens so by the middle of June that year 
I had a bunches of queens, some oliveras, some from my bait hives. And then what I did is I set up two groups of colonies in the same apiary. It was along a, along a hedgerow, along a fence row. And I started each colony in this experiment as a two-frame nuke, and I gave it one of the two types of queens. And then I just left the colonies um, alone all summer. I had set up these, they were started out as two-frame nukes, but they, then I put them into ten-frame hives. And I just let the colonies go all summer long. And the one thing I did do carefully, though, is all the queens, all the colonies that got the Oliveras queens were in this group, and all the colonies that got the bait hive queens were in this other group. So there was, some, there was about 100 yards between the two groups of colonies. And come October, having just left the colonies live on their own without any treatments and without any checks even, I measured their mite levels in October. And the following winter, I looked at how well the colonies were. Um, the following April, I saw how which of the colonies were still alive. Here's what I found. And these are, it's going to be a comparison of the non-local, the Oliveras queens versus the local stock. And what I measured, what I'm showing you here are the counts of mites per 300 bees measured with a sugar shake test. And this was done at the end of the summer, 13th of October in 2019. And so these were the counts I got for the um, eight Oliveras queen colonies. Uh, I guess it's seven Oliveras queen colonies. 17, 10, 4, 24, 9, 5, 18. So they ranged from medium to high. And the bait hive colonies, the, my counts were all low except for one colony. Okay. And I, I have to stress, I don't know where these swarms came from. I think this one might have come from a beekeeper's hive, which had a, a lousy queen, or a, a queen that didn't have varroa resistance. Clearly it didn't have ability, the bees didn't have the ability to control varroa. So big difference in the mite counts in the fall. What about colony survival to the following spring through the winter? Here's what happened. The Oliveras queen colonies, only one survived the one that had the lowest mite count. In the bait hives, all of the colonies survived, except the one that had the high mite counts. So the difference was 14% here and 85% there. And the only thing that differed between these two treatment groups was the source of the queens. So that's an example of what I mean by how you can, getting bees that are locally adapted and well adapted uh, and being locally adapted means being adapted to living with Varroa as well. So it's a pretty stark difference. I didn't expect it to be this strong, but that's, that's what I found. What was perhaps most interesting to me was I did get from Oliveras one colony that had very good Varroa resistance, and it survived. Um, it, it was also one of the nastiest colonies I've ever known, and so it... Um, uh, and that, that probably is not by coincidence. Those bees, those bees were very good at defending themselves from beekeepers and from Varroa. <laughs> okay. So that was the first guideline. Get bees that are locally adapted, and, and that includes being adapted to dealing with Varroa. My second guideline is to house your colonies in small hives. And when I say a small hive, I mean one deep hive. 10 frame hive body, and maybe one shallow honey super over a queen excluder. And again, I did an experiment to look at the effect of hive size. And so I set up two groups of 12 colonies. In one group, they were all left in a single 10 frame hive body, and these are simulating wild colonies. In the other group, they were in, you can see they were in four deep hive bodies, which is a standard arrangement here in New York State for a honey producing colony. You live two deep hive bodies for a brood chamber, and then you put on two deep honey supers on top. So that's what I did. So these were honey production colonies. These were simulated wild colonies, and they were in the same location. They're, this, what you're seeing here is part of it, one side of a building. Here's the end of that same building. So these two apiaries are only about 100 years hundred yards apart. Okay, and then I just let the colonies live. They were not treated for Varroa. And here's the statistics about how many were still alive after two years. 83% of the colonies in the small hive group were alive after two years. Only two of the 
12 colonies in the large hive group were alive after two years. And here's why there's that difference in their survival. These are the mite counts, mites per 300 bees that were recorded in these colonies over the two year period. The colonies were set up in matched pairs back in July 19, July 2012. They started out with the mite counts the same. In the first year, the colonies were small and the mites didn't grow up to high levels in either kind of colony. So the May, the beginning of our summer, May 2013, the mite counts were low in both the, the large hive colonies and the small hive colonies. And then as you might expect, the, the large hive colonies, the honey producers, they tended not to swarm and their mite counts went up. And whereas the small hive colonies, they tended to swarm, they had brood breaks, etc., and their mite counts stayed low. And this is, and it is this difference which got even more extreme in September, which underlies this difference in 17% survival for the large hive treatment and 83% for the small hive treatment. And again, none of these colonies was ever treated for mites. My third gut, so the point here is. Um, Oops, I'm going the wrong way. Oh, one, again, it's, and it's probably not by chance. In this experiment, there were two colonies that survived in the large hive treatment group, and they had very low mite counts. And again, those colonies were quite defensive. <laughs> one was so defensive, I just moved it back to the, my laboratory and put it up in a, the corner of a field and left it because it was so unpleasant to open up that colony. Those bees are very good at defending themselves from Varroa and from beekeepers. Third, third guideline is to space your colonies as, as widely as possible, but it doesn't have to be super widely. Um, and I, I base this um, guideline on an experiment I did where I set up Again, two groups of 12 colonies where the colonies were set up identically except the spacing of the colonies was different. 12 of the colonies were set up in this apiary, what you can see here, close together, two by two, in groups of two. The other 12 colonies were set up nearby. Here's a, a bird's eye view of the map of the area. Here's the apiary on this map. And here, all of these little dots here, this is where the other 12 colonies are. And they're scattered around in this brushy area. It's, a, uh, it's an old, long, thin field. And I made little places off that long field to put the hives. And um, so in one group, the colonies were tight together. In the other, they're more widely spaced. They weren't wide, super widely spaced, but they were 30 to 100 um, yards apart. And none of these colonies were treated for varroa. And what did I find? I'm just looking at their survival. Again, a similar pattern to what we saw before. Zero were alive after two years. The colonies get through their first summer okay without treatment. But then the second summer, the varroa goes crazy in these colonies because some start to die. Some, as soon as some die, other bees come and rob out the honey in those colonies and they bring home lots of mites. So the mites sp spread among these colonies as some collapsed. Whereas after two years, the dispersed colonies, there were five still alive after two years. So when we keep our colonies crowded together, like we see here, you get this mite bomb phenomenon. It's probably mite bombs, maybe not the best term. I think better think a better name, I think, would be robber lure phenomenon. When colonies collapse with Varroa, they, they're lures for robbers, which then the robbers take the mites home. My fourth guideline for this Darwinian beekeeping is to line your hives with propolis collection screens or build them with a rough lumber. And uh, this is an example of the effect you get with a propolis collection screen. A lot, there's quite a bit of propolis in on the walls. And this there's work done by Marla Spivak's lab at the University of Minnesota that she, she looks at things like the level of activity of certain genes involved in disease resistance or dis disease defense, those genes 
are operating at a much lower level if the bees have a propolis envelope. It's because the disease levels are not as high. The microbial disease levels are not as high if there's a lot of propolis on the walls of the nest. Fifth guideline is provide your most resilient, your lowest mite count colonies with 10 to 20 percent drone comb. <laughs> and um, the, what's the rationale of this? It's to promote the genetic success of your best colonies. Those colonies that are showing you that they don't need mite treatments, you want them to be making the drones. You want them to make as many drones as possible. That will help spread their genes. I love this photo. You know, we talk about drones being hungry. I hadn't realized until I saw this photo that drones are hungry, right? For as soon as they're coming out of the cell. Hey, feed me. Yeah, thank you. Sixth suggestion or guideline is keep the nest structure intact. Put each, that is to say, when you're working your bees, put each frame back in its original location and with its original orientation. No reversing of brood boxes, no um, breaking up the brood nest, things like that. Those were the things I was taught for swarm control. Reverse the brood boxes in the spring, um, do a zebra treatment of the brood combs to spread out the brood nest. Those things do, of course, they do really inhibit swarming, but they must be hard, very hard on the bee colonies too. Seventh guideline, provide just a small entrance at the bottom. And I think and those of you that have been keeping bees for any length of time probably see, well, I can't speak for Texas, of course, but up, up where I live, the bees in come fall, they plug the top openings with propolis in the hive and they seal up any little crack between the inner cover and the, and the top of the hive. They, they're really trying to make that place Snug, tight and snug, mm -hmm. and um, so I, I, um, my recommendation is provide just a small entrance at the bottom, no top entrance. I'll come back to that, and put a styrofoam board above the inner cover to give them extra insulation. My top, my bottom, and my entrances in my Darwinian beekeeping hives are just two inches wide, and I put a half inch mesh screen as a mouse excluder over the opening. And I want to stress that, and this is something I stress, but it may not be so relevant for where you are because you have such um, uh, gentle winters. Um, but for beekeepers up north, uh, there's work coming out that is explaining that if, we, if one does not give the bees a top entrance and use just a small entrance, the bees do much better in the winter. And it's counterintuitive because people think, well, I need to give the bees a top entrance to let out the moist air so that it doesn't get too hot, um, wet inside the hive. But this, there's a gentleman in England who's been looking at this really closely. And what he finds is if, you, if bees are living in a well-insulated hive and there's no top entrance, there's a, a pocket of war, very warm air in the top. He calls it a heat pool in the top of the hive. And in that area, it's so warm, there's no condensation. Where there is condensation is on the cool walls near the bottom, but that's below the bee, so it's not a problem. Whereas if you put a top entrance in a hive, that heat pool, no surprise, it gets much smaller. It's not very deep because so much heat is being lost via the vent. And so at least in northern cold climates, this is what we're learning actually works best. And we've also been learning that in the winter, the bees really need water. Um, that's In our winters, the most thirsty colonies I have, the, those thirsty bees I have seen were bees um, in January, this time of year, um, when they had not been able to get out. I had a high colony of bees and an observation I have in my office here, in fact, and one day, one winter day, it got warm enough for the snow to melt and warm enough for the bees to fly. And those bees were just massively collecting water. And the first bees that were collecting the water came back and did waggle dances, which went on for almost 10 minutes. They were so excited to have found water and, and were advertising it with top, with top intensity. So. I stress that we need to improve the insulation of our hives. Maybe not where you are,
but certainly up north. But even in warm climates, I bet it makes life easier for bees, just as it does for us, to live in a well-insulated structure. Something that we need to look at more in southern climates, not just in northern climates, I think. Eighth guideline, um, do not disturb colonies in winter. <laughs> this again is maybe most, more, most relevant for beekeepers up north. And this is one of my bee yards. Um, so, and when I say don't disturb them, I mean no checking, no stimulative feeding, no pollen patties, etc. Because uh, I, I have learned by putting a temperature probe in a hive and watching what happens if I take the lid off a hive in the winter, even a brief removal of the lid causes the winter cluster to raise its temperature in alarm for several hours. I don't know quite what the impact is of that alarm response to a colony in winter, but I'm sure it, it means there, uh, it's a, it's almost certainly it's a kind of a stress. They're burning through a lot of food. My last and ninth and final guideline for Darwinian beekeeping is this one, which is the trickiest one. It is refrain from treating colonies for varroa. And this you can't do lightly. This requires super diligent beekeeping. You have to monitor the mite levels in your colonies. Because some of your colonies, at least in my experience, some of my colonies know all about how to kill mites and control mites, and some don't. And what I want, the reason I monitor the colonies closely, their mite levels, is because I want to be able to identify the colonies that are not handling the mites or not controlling the mites. And if the mite level gets too high, and for me, that's more than 10, 10 mites per 100 bees using the sugar shake or alcohol wash test, then I do one of two things. I either euthanize the colony by pouring warm, soapy water into the hive at dusk, and you can, it, does, it kills the bees, and you can, rinse the, you can rinse your equipment off to get rid of the soap from the hive with just flushing everything with clean water. Um, and this eliminates your non-resistant colonies before they collapse and, it, and, and thus it avoids producing mite bobs or robber lures. And so you're actually at being a selective agent. You're, you're eliminating the junk stock that you have. Um, the, there is an alternative to euthanasia and that is of course to kill the queen, um, treat the colony with miticide and requeen the colony with a queen of resistant stock. If you can, if you have access to that. Um, but the key thing here is you want to, you you want to refrain refrain from treating the colonies for varroa, but also monitoring them. And when you by refraining from treating with treating for varroa, you will quickly learn which colonies are not able to control varroa and which ones are. And the ones that are, those are the keepers. You might wonder, well, okay, how does, how does, what kind of colony survival do you get? Well, here's, uh, uh, here's just some examples of my Darwinian beekeeping hives. I've showed this one already. Here's another one by an old barn. Here's one I just put by the edge of woods. I space them around. I've been doing this for um, quite a few years now. Uh, keep 10 to 12 colonies this way. Uh, summer survival is almost 100%. Winter survival is, is 84%. It's not perfect. And overall, for the whole year, on average, the survival is 81%. And that's actually very close to what I see in the bee tree colonies of colonies that are established, about 80%. And to make up in the spring, I make up the, the losses by either splitting the colonies. If I've got some that are really strong, I split them and rear the, let them rear their own queen. Or I put up bait hives and capture some swarms. So um, that's, that's a kind of a, a quick tour of this concept of Darwinian beekeeping. And uh, if you want to learn more about it, there is this book that I've written. It's a book called The Lives of Bees. It's not specifically about Darwinian beekeeping, though the last chapter is about Darwinian beekeeping. But this book um, is a book that I wrote to, to um, share what what we know about how bees live in the wild, honeybees live in the wild. And I think this is important for beekeepers to know how they live in the wild, because unless we know how bees are living in the wild, we don't fully recognize or understand 
how we're changing their lives when we use the standard methods of beekeeping. And um, so this book is kind of like gives you a um, ground level knowledge of the of the true natural history of honeybees. So, okay, um, that's my talk, and I'm um, I'd be delighted to uh, take questions at this point. Yeah. And so. Uh, Let's see, I need to open up the little chat box, I think. Or maybe, uh, maybe uh, Sandra, could you read the questions to me and then I could just share my thoughts? Absolutely. So uh, okay. everybody who's on the line, if you have questions, and I'm sure you do, please throw those in the chat box and I will share them uh, with Tom. Thank you. We don't have any quite yet, but it's coming along. But everyone is saying how much they love your new book. <laughs> oh, well, that's good. That's that's what an author likes to hear. It took yeah. about it was a it was one year of working I don't know ten, twelve, fourteen hour days to, to produce yeah. that book. It, it's uh, but it was it was very rewarding. I hope I hope readers will enjoy it too. Yes, yes. So the qu first question we have is what is the definition of local bees so or local queens mm. is there a certain radius or environmental factors when you think of getting a local queen yeah i would say um local would probably be within your part of whatever state you're in mm -hmm. like um i know texas is a big state so yeah it's a great question for texas isn't it yeah <laughs> <laughs> South uh, texas, north texas East yeah texas. Right. I would say, I don't know, I, I, I've only visited Texas a few times, but I've been struck by the, the variety of places. So I would say Texas would be maybe four different, four different parts of Texas, maybe, maybe more. Um, on other hand, some states like Kentucky, probably anywhere, a, a queen that that's comes out of a colony in Kentucky is, is, is probably good for all of Kentucky. Maybe the same for Pennsylvania. It's a great question coming from Texas. I know. <laughs> <It's the biggest. laughs> there is a broad range of environments, so yeah. Yeah. Would you say it's it's maybe you know, um, you know maybe a, you know at best maybe 100, 150 miles? You know, producers producing hives and queens within that type of territory. Yeah, that 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 would certainly. I think that would be very safe within a hundred miles around your area. Yep. Uh, Stan Gore also asked, how do you feel about eight frame medium with bottom two boxes, the brood trick chamber? So if it has a smaller, not the 10 yeah. frame, but the eight frame and the bottom yeah. two boxes are, are brood, is that equivalent to what you would consider it like a small space? Yeah, that would be, that would be. It's, I would have to say it's probably not quite as, as favorable for the bees to, to use two mediums rather than one deep simply because having the there's a bee space between the two the two brood boxes and that um, the bees seem to do better if they have one long tall sheet of comb as they do in the wild and there's a, as you probably you may know that there's a lot of there's a lot of traditional beekeeping in Europe where they used hives with just one box with but the combs were deep about 15 inches deep and that that's those the bees do seem looks like from what I've seen do really well in those. But you can certainly do what you're doing, and and actually I endorse very much the eight frame equipment. It's 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 much easier to manage but to handle. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Lisa asked, how far apart do you keep your hives generally? Yeah, I try to keep the my hives. Uh, I, I, let's see, I'm. I've got one apiary where I'm doing an experiment where I've only got the hives about 10 meters apart, 30 feet apart. Um, but when I, in most of the Darwinian beekeeping I do, I try to put one here and one there and maybe, I don't know, 100, 100 yards apart, something like that. Um, and that just requires, you know, that, I'm sure that's not feasible for, for a lot of people. I happen to live in a place where there's a lot of countryside and so I just go around and ask people can I park a hive of bees on this on this part of your property usually it's near the road but out of sight 
And most yeah. people are happy to do that because I say, well, I'll give you some honey for it, but I, I'd like to take advantage of the, being able to spread out the hives. Yeah. Thank you for that. We have some, you know, areas where we have that kind of flexibility. And then we have many uh, individuals who, who obviously beekeep in an urban area. And there's, you know, yes. not, not quite as much room um, no. in some of our <laughs> backyards here in Houston. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. If you can at least get them maybe 10 or 15 feet apart and facing different directions, just do as much as you can to reduce the drifting of bees between the colonies. And maybe even most importantly, just don't let any mite bombs go off in your in your apiary. Yeah, so monitor them and keep track, even if you're not, you know, treating right away. Yeah. Yeah, I we, we did this study where we actually set up a situation where we encouraged mm -hmm. um, five four colonies were set up without treatments and in big hives and we wanted them to collapse and all uh, it was actually three and all three collapsed and nearby we had other colonies where the bees were of a different color the collapsing colonies were black bees and the colonies that were um, near living nearby they were yellow bees and it, it is it was a very sad sight to see when the co black bee colonies were collapsing how much traffic of the yellow bees there was at those dying collapsing colonies and how and then how quickly the mite counts shot up in the yellow bee colonies as they brought home mites dur during their robbing yeah oh i would be sad to watch <laughs> yeah that's for the greater good of science but yeah, yeah when it, it's, Painful, but it was it was it is it is it's it's uh it was it it was a very sharp clear picture of just how much when colonies are nearby and it makes it and thus the colonies can easily find and rob one another if one colony starts collapsing with mites mites are going all over the place yeah. uh, the next question we have is from Kim Meyer and she asks since bees at least in the Northeast I'm sure here too like to be high up have you ever tested that and would you recommend placing bees high up somehow and how <laughs> um i haven't tested that one that's a tough one and yeah. what i do try to do is i and for me high up high up might not be so important where you are i think for us high up it matters to the bees because it helps them do their cleansing flights in the winter they can go out and i i what i i have done some experiments where i've put I put up hives in pairs, one on by a building. One hive is set at ground level, the other is on the roof of the shed. And it's not a tall shed, but it puts the hive, the hive that's on the roof is about 10 feet up. And it's like night and day in the winter in terms of the, the mortality of worker bees that are when they go out on their cleansing flights. When they're down at ground level, they come out and a lot crash on the snow and then they're stuck. Whereas the ones that are higher up, they fly out and they, they're, they're, un, they're not strong flyers, but they don't crash into the snow. So mm -hmm. I can only speak then for a northern climate. It may not, may not make Mount a hill of beans in Texas, but <laughs> that's, um, uh, yeah. So it, it, like a lot of beekeeping, it's, it's location. To, where it varies with location. Yeah. Um, do you, go ahead. do you, yeah, do you, uh, open up covered brood and see if the resistant bees actually remove the uh, mites from inside or are you watching if Thank they you. open it themselves and remove them and then cover them again yes we've just started doing that i didn't i didn't know about that for many years so it was only two years ago i learned that that's another very yeah. effective way for controlling the mites the uncapping and recapping, Capping. and we are we are seeing that in these survivor colonies that we pull out of the wild. Yes, yeah. a, I was going to ask you that in uh, Broward, but I didn't get to it, so oh, I, I see. joined this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So oh, good. Oh, uh, yeah, good. You're very adaptable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My my, co my colleagues took over and they asked you all the questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm glad you asked that because it's actually yeah, an important thing. The reason I don't mention it, Anton, is I, I haven't collected enough data to show it um, 
Okay. To, I, I need to do that more. I, I, I yeah. kick myself for not doing that for years. Because you don't I'm even have to open this. Oh, what, what are you finding? Um, they remove the bees on some hives, but not yeah. all of them yeah. do. They, they take yeah. the, the fruit out. Yeah, what I'm, I'm I'm not actually even opening up the cells. I'm just scoring capped cells to see whether there's been an open and op the cell cap has been opened and then repaired. Okay, interesting. Well, we look forward to that next round. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's the spirit. Yeah, always something new. Yeah. There is, isn't there? We're always learning about them. I think. Uh if somebody asked me what percentage of the inner workings of a honeybee colony we really understand, I'd say it's maybe 30%. <laughs> There's, those bees are always doing something that is fascinating. Yeah. Absolutely. And you and I, many times you, you read the studies that individuals have or even observations and you know you go in and you expect a certain thing and then the bees do something totally different right yeah. <laughs> like, well. or, th or they do or they do something where you can see them do it like they build mm -hmm. a certain amount of drone comb how on earth does do the bees know that they've got 15 percent drone comb and that they should stop or they've only got five percent they should go on turn it up mm -hmm. that's a big mystery to me yeah. Yeah, definitely um, also, David asks, "What's the advantage of the smaller of the smaller box that keeps mites low?" It's the swarming. Okay. I'm pretty sure it's well. It's it's Warm it's cycle. not just the swarming. Yeah. yeah, it it means that. I'm I'm so glad so glad David asked that question because it's fundamental to the. It's probably the most important difference between living in a in a natural situation or a beekeeper's big hive. When these colonies live in a relatively small nest cavity, a couple of things happen. Um, they don't have as large a brood nest, so there's not as much opportunity for the varroa to reproduce. The colonies tend to swarm, and when a colony swarms, it actually exports about 70% of its adult mites. Um, it creates a break in the brood rearing, so there's a period of time in the colony when there's no sealed brood, so the mites can't hide. And then there's one more thing that happens when the bees live in a small hive. They stop rearing brood early, at least in my climate, because by the end of August, they've got that hive pretty well full of honey. They're not rearing brood. They, they've, they've reared their winter bees already in, in, in late August and early September. And that, of course, no, no brood, no varroa reproduction. Right. So yeah, it's, it's that, it's um, a lot of things are going on with with him, giving the bee, giving the bees a small home, that makes sense. you can. But I do want to stress that you can. I do my beekeeping. I can do this Darwinian beekeeping by putting a shallow honey super over the the deep hive body for their brood chamber and, and for their basic home. And but I but, but I I don't leave it on for very long. I, as soon as the bees have filled that up, I take it off and, and let the bees you know have to deal with the with a natural sized home. Yeah. That makes sense. And then they do conserve the brood so they have room for that honey so they can get through the fall and the winter. Yep. Yeah. Oh, very interesting. Uh, the next question comes from uh, Anne Marie. I read about a study you were doing to find bee trees around the country with citizen scientists volunteers. How is that yes. going? It's it's going pretty well. I, I've learned a lot. I, I think it's it's much more of an organizational challenge than I realized. Um, so I've, what I've done is I've worked with, a, a, I think it's about a total of five beekeepers now, three in England and, and two here in North America. And, I, and a lot of people responded and responded initially, but it's only been a small number that have stayed with the program. And, and it's, it's that stick to itiveness that's critical because we need to follow these wild colonies for uh, at least three or four years to get a okay. good sense of their survivorship patterns. Okay. So that it's it's making a it's making a, a good little start, and it's it's really surprising a lot of people in England. They they're finding these these wild colonies in in their churches and in um, manure pits and things like that. They're finding them all over the place, and and are in castles, and and they're realizing. Oh, these colonies, they've, they've been, and some of the old timers there will say, oh, that, those be, that place has been occupied by bees for many years. And, but now we're getting real good data on that. And so far, it looks very interesting that 
very few colonies are dying out. Uh, it's been going on for the two summers now, and very low, very low colony mortality so far, on the order of about fifteen percent each year. Wow. That's yeah. interesting. Do you still need individuals to participate? I think I've got. I, I'm, I feel like I'm still in the pilot stage. If okay. I if I if I feel like I can scale it up. Um, uh, uh, then I then I will then I will expand it, but okay. but not right now. It's it's just it's for me. It's a, it's a learning process how to do this with a without just doing it myself. I it's a different you. different <laughs> skill set actually. It <laughs> is it is. Well, when, if you ever need any, we have lots of wild colonies here in Houston. So. Okay. <laughs> Great. What um and they're in buildings or trees in parks or buildings, where do you find them? Trees in literally every neighborhood. So, um, yeah. you know, because Houston is so temperate, right? It's very yep. easy. We don't get no snow We uh, very often. We did get some recently, <laughs> um, but it, it doesn't get very cold. So, you know, it really makes for a conducive environment. Now, I, I think we still have, you know, other issues, pesticides being one of those, um, oh, yeah. you know, in, inside the city. Um, and obviously, you know, diseases in, in Varro and things like that. But in general, um, mm -hmm. we see them thriving throughout our uh, communities around town. Yeah. Yeah, that, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that, Sandra, the bit about the pesticides, because I know there are a lot of beekeepers, particularly in the upper Midwest, and where that's, just, that's their number one problem. It's just so much pesticide yeah. that's being used in the environment. Because they're in the middle of agri agricultural areas, and yeah, yeah we're, we're lucky. Sometimes cities can be the most, actually, the benost, most benign places for honeybees. Yeah. Uh, but they tend to be, at least in northern parts of the states, they're warmer, and they tend not to have so much pesticide. Yeah. No, we find yeah. um, so here in Houston, most of the beekeepers here on the phone are are actually uh, managing hives around the metro area. So. Um, yep. You know, there's a lot of things blooming throughout the year because everyone's planting That's flowers true. and they That's right. they want yeah. their yards to be gorgeous. And so there's a lot of diversity within um, within the city. We actually see those populations do quite well. So. What about swarms in the city? How do you how are you handling that? Uh, we we call uh, on this group, or uh, <laughs> <laughs> we have um, quite a few what we would call. Um, uh, you know, bee rescue groups and, and individuals who remove bees yeah. from um, homes. And of course, we call on them um, when when the community has um, swarms. Like I just said, we actually have a swarm list um, where Great. people can sign up. And so if someone emails the club and says, hey, I have a swarm, then it can go out to that group. And um, people from pretty much now until almost October, um, you know, depending on the swarms, um, can pick up swarms around town and try to rehome those. Great, yeah. It, that, it can really help a colony of bees if they, if they, if somebody puts them into a hive where the combs are already built. That's a huge right. advantage. From a head start. <laughs> Big head start, massive head start. So one of the next questions is from Stan Gore, and he asks, what about feeding dry pollen any time of the year? Do you often uh, feed with pollen or um, any other kinds of sugar syrups? I don't feed my bees at all. Okay. Um, I think, um, you might wonder why that is. It's because I don't see that the, the bees seem to have all the food they need. I leave it up to them. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of the, but there is another thing that the, the artificial pollen materials, I know some beekeepers do that because they need to, they want their colonies to grow up as fast as possible in the spring, but I, I'd rather have the bees stay stay in tune with, with the seasons and, and to, um, and part of that is, is working with the pollen sources. It's for sure in the spring, the bees are all over whatever pollen sources they can find because they're desperate for it. But I, but I want them to, I want the, if there's a colony that's not good at pollen collection, I don't want that colony to continue, actually. That's pretty hard-hearted, but that's how I look at it. Well, back to the natural selection, right? So <laughs> either they do well or, you know, maybe it just wasn't their time, so. Yeah, yeah. So the next question, uh, Joe, our vice president asks, what was the distribution of the surviving five hives in guideline number three? 
let's go back some to that. kind of bunching are more or less evenly distributed. So I think that was the one, how far apart were they? Joe, do you remember that slide? Let's see. Uh, uh, yeah, this is one where you had uh, 12 hives in an apiary and 12 spread out about over 100 yards. And I just wondered, now the five that survived over the hundred in the hundred yard group were they like all in one area or like all spread out kind of evenly? Um, they were they were scattered around. It's hard to say what it looked to me like it was a random distribution, not like they were evenly spread. And yeah, that that long array that long array is. Um, I think it was about 300 yards long. I have to go back to the slide and look at it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they were, they yeah they they were distributed around. Mm -hmm. We could track that end. over probably 10 houses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everyone has one in their backyard. <laughs> that that long meadow that I had for that, the the astronomers here at Cornell had set up a, a some sort of special telescope where they needed a very long array and when they took it down I said oh I want to use that field you guys made and they said that was okay it was nice right next to a beaver pond so it was a very scenic place as well oh, sounds lovely it was pretty All nice right. uh, the next question is from Kimberly Meyer do top bar hives conform to the ideas of Darwinian beekeeping better than other hive types um I think so uh, the, the nice thing about, I don't use top bar hives, um, but I, I can see that um, they give the bees just that much more freedom to build the comb mm -hmm. in the way that they want. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I guess I'm a little too fussy about being able to open up a hive without doing damage. I know the top bar hives I, well, I don't have enough experience, but um, yeah, I, I I I want the combs to be fairly sturdy too, so I can pick them up and turn, put them on their, lay them flat, and take measurements. And with top bar hives, with top bar hives, the combs don't have that support, and they can break off. So yeah. that's why I haven't used it. But if you're not if you're not needing to measure something, if you're just letting, you just want a hive of bees to take a. a, a some a comb of honey out every so often. I think a top bar hive is just fine, mm -hmm. but you have to be more careful in your Definitely. manipulations. Especially here in Houston, it gets hot, and so the wax gets very soft. Oh, yeah. I have I have accidentally dropped them <laughs> without meaning to before, and not I even see. just a top bar hive, even a regular Langstroth, and it just melts in the Texas sun. So. Oh yeah. Not wow. Good. That's heavy duty. <laughs> yeah. those, those bees must work hard to deal with those they temperatures. They work hard to keep it cool. <laughs> Could, do you try to put them in the shade, the hives in the shade? Can you? Oh, there's a uh, lot of passionate discussion around that. <laughs> uh, I think that some, some do, and some leave them in the sun. Obviously, there's also evidence that supports that um, small hive beetles prefer hives that are also in the shade and not in the sun because it gets very mm. hot. Um, yeah. uh, so I think that's kind of a preference for the beekeeper. I have some that are in shade that do do fine. I have some that are in sun that also do fine when it you know comes to small be small high beetles. It certainly is better for the beekeeper if it's in the shade. <laughs> yeah, yeah so. definitely. I wonder for the bees whether, I wonder if anybody's looked at in your situation of having very hot days, whether colonies that are in well insulated hives find it easier to keep cool. They might see less fanning, less water collection. Because yeah. I know for sure that when you live in a well insulated house in the summer, it's a lot more comfortable than in exactly. a poorly insulated you building. You can monitor it. Yeah. yeah, I'm sure. All right, our next question is from Tom, and he says, What is the best method? for queen rearing that you use? Um, well, the method that I use, Tom, is I just, um, I let the bees do all the work. I let them choose the larvae, et cetera, et cetera. So I just dequeen a colony or I make a nuke, a queenless nuke, and let the bees take it from there. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not high production of queens, but it produces high quality queens. And it's again, it's part of this philosophy of 
the bees are the best beekeepers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's I don't, I don't graft. I don't. Yeah. Yeah. It's a different approach, and it doesn't produce lots of queens. I don't need, and I can do that because I don't need lots of queens. Usually, I'm just if I need queens, it's usually in the context of splitting a colony and and basically duplicating a swarming event. So a different approach. Absolutely. And if, well, Tom, we're up on our time today, but I just want to thank you so much. We really enjoyed your talk oh. today. Thank you for answering our questions. And I'm, I'm sure this group has many more, uh, but, uh, but really appreciate you um, joining us today and, and sharing your wisdom with us. It was quite special. Oh, thank you. It's been my, it's been my pleasure. You guys are a, a, a very, very um, friendly group <laughs> and it's been great to work with you. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you very much for inviting me. Absolutely. Lovely to have you. Have okay. a wonderful season. <laughs> yep. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. So the last bit of fun for today, of course, is our virtual door prizes. So Nicole, are you ready? You got the magic fingertips. Who's our first winner? <laughs> I do. Yes, I do. Let me um, make sure that everyone is still with us because I see that our numbers have changed since I did the drawing. Oh, some people are trying to join. That's smart. <laughs> yep, it looks like our first person left. Sure did. All right, let me look at number two. What do we have for prizes? Why don't, why don't you let us know? Uh, today, we have lots of goodies, drum roll. First of all, we obviously have Tom Seeley's book, um, the new one that he has about the untold stories of bees. So we have a book from Tom. We have a very classic HBA t-shirt. I'm sure someone has one on the phone they can model for us. Um, also, we have an HBA hat uh, to give away, and of course, another beetle board. All right, our first uh, winner is Don Hobart. Don, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. I had to get unmuted. <laughs> What's your pick, Don? What would you like today? That ceiling book. Oh, good choice. <laughs> I would want that one too. <laughs> All, right. All right. Got you down, Don. Congratulations. All right. Next up, we have Olga Boskic. Olga. Olga, you there? Yeah, I'm here. Woohoo! It's Bozich. Ah, oh, yes. thank you. <laughs> All right, Olga, what would you like? T shirt, hat, or a beetle board? What is a beetle board? Uh, it's one of those, um, it kind of goes uh, underneath the main board. Beetle board, yes. Oh, it, oh it, it's like uh, decreases the opening. Uh, it, no. it, it traps small beetles, uh, small hive beetles in the bottom. Oh, um, it's a screen board with a, a, tra a trap. Yeah. Yeah, I'll take that. Okay. All right. Thank Olga's you. got our beetle board. All right. Let's see who else we have here. And our next winner is. Becky Stemper, again, Becky's lucky. Whatever, I won not too long ago. I know you <laughs> did, but I else. drew your name again, Becky. <laughs> Just lucky. I am okay. lucky, but I would like to pass it on to somebody else. Okay, okay. fine. <laughs> I like your shirt. That's a cute shirt too. <laughs> All right, let's see who else we got here. All right, next up, our next winner is Lisa Luker. Lisa. Lisa. She asked a question. Yes, I'm here. 
great. Lisa, what would you like? A t-shirt or a hat? I'll take the hat, please. Awesome. Everybody's getting outfitted for the new season. <laughs> Hats, t-shirts. Nope. Ooh, Kim, what are you knitting? I can see you knitting. Oh, me? Um, I'm knitting a sweater. A sweater? <laughs> Why? I just <laughs> All right. And our final, our final winner is David Haas. Haas, like the avocado. David, are you there? David, you're getting a t-shirt. <laughs> and if you, guys, if you guys look, he's got the hat there. So that's the, the winning hat there for Chris. Uh, all men. Hi, Chris, how do you say your last name? <laughs> that's the hat. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you all so much for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed uh, Tom as much as I did. Um, I'm a big fan though. So like, you know, moments of having the star on TV, that's exciting. Um, obviously we'll be back again at third Tuesday of February. And so that's gonna be 21. Oh, darn it, I did it again. It's <laughs> <laughs> 2021, February 16th is our next meeting. So look forward to seeing you then. In the meantime, stay safe. Thank you. Bye, guys.